You are listening to As a Woman, Episode 40, Stress and Infertility. In this episode, I'm talking to Dr. Laura Shaheen about mood and fertility, including stress, depression, anxiety, and how they can impact getting pregnant. There is real research out there. Learn what we know, learn what you can do about it, but most importantly, take care of yourself. Welcome to As a Woman, the podcast hosted by fertility physician, Dr. Natalie Crawford, to educate and empower women. Each week, learn about your health, your fertility, and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community, fostering collaboration over competition, while learning how to authentically find your voice and amplify others as a woman. Hi, friends. Welcome back to As a Woman. This is episode 40. First of all, isn't that crazy? We're at 40 episodes. I love you so much. Thanks for your support. This episode is all about stress and infertility. I get asked about this all the time because I think people are genuinely curious and they feel very stressed. Our current lives are very stressful. And even though we don't have data that stress causes infertility per se, we certainly think that it can impact it. And we do know that extreme stress does dramatically impact your fertility. So what is the difference between extreme stress and regular stress? How can your body differentiate? I asked one of my good friends, Dr. Laura Shaheen, to come on and talk to me about this. And one of the reasons why is that she deals very often with patients who are having recurrent miscarriages or lots of miscarriage. And I know that emotional well-being is a high concern to her. And I thought she'd be the perfect person to talk through some of these things, the research that's out there, what can help, what doesn't help, and how we as reproductive endocrinologists counsel our patients when it comes to stress and also depression and anxiety and trying to get pregnant. Laura is a board-certified RE. She practices and is a partner at Pacific Northwest Fertility in Seattle, Washington. She's also clinical faculty in the Department of OBGYN at the University of Washington, and she is the director for the Center of Recurrent Pregnancy Loss. She is a lovely person, an amazing physician. She has dedicated her lives to helping women, and she's also a really passionate writer. She's got a great blog. She's on Instagram at Dr. Laura Shaheen, and she's also written a few books. One is called Planting the Seeds of Pregnancy, An Integrative Approach to Fertility Care, and the other one is Not Broken, An Approachable Guide to Miscarriage and Recurrent Pregnancy Loss. I know that I've shared some of her books, especially Not Broken, with some of my patients, and she truly is a leader in our field on both RPL, Recurrent Pregnancy Loss, and also Environmental Toxins. But I thought she'd be the perfect person to come in and talk about this emotional state of trying to get pregnant and how stress and infertility can intersect. So without further ado, here's our interview from when we were at ASRM not too long ago. Hey, Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to be talking to you about a topic that I know we're both really passionate about, which is the emotional aspect of infertility and this journey. Thank you so much, Natalie. I'm really excited to be here. I feel like you have such a unique perspective on this. With all of your research and interest in pregnancy loss, we all know that that is such an emotional time for every woman, every couple who goes through it. But you and I also both know that, you know, stress and mental health and depression and anxiety, that they're very prevalent in patients who are having infertility, regardless of if they ever have loss or not, right? Absolutely. Study after study shows that our patient population with infertility and recurrent miscarriage have a high prevalence and incidence of symptoms of clinical depression and anxiety. I think this is fascinating. When I was a fellow, you may not know this, I actually did some research on depression, anxiety, and stress because I was really interested in it, probably partially because my grandfather was a psychiatrist, so I was always interested in mental health issues even though I knew that was never the field I was going to choose. But what we did is just an observational study of every new patient who came into the clinic got screened with a standardized scale for depression, anxiety, and stress. And we didn't do anything about it. Nobody got referred on. We just collected the data to then go back and look. And what we found is, one, 
that it was highly prevalent with a stress scale. It was, you know, almost the vast majority of patients who came in were stressed. And that depression existed in 50% of the group. That was clinical depression and anxiety even more than that. And then we showed that those patients who were higher stress levels were less likely to initiate fertility treatments, you know, one. So they were less likely to even give it a try. So, of course, they were also less likely to be successful. And I really feel like this is something in our field that we really don't talk about as much as we should. What do you think? I agree with that, Natalie. This is not something that I learned about in residency and fellowship, but it's something that I see in my everyday practice. And research has been coming out even more and more. There's an excellent study, a Danish study, looking at over 42,000 patients with infertility. and a huge number of patients there. That's a great study. Absolutely. 35% of patients undergoing IVF treatment screen positive for clinical depression. The largest study that was done in the United States was published in 2016 in Fertility and Sterility, looked at 352 women um, undergoing fertility treatment. 56% had significant signs of depression and 76% had significant signs of anxiety. One thing I love about this study is it looked at the men too undergoing treatment. And of the almost 300 men they surveyed, 32% had clinical signs of depression and 60% had anxiety. I think it's just showing us how important some of these things we call lifestyle factors are. And I know they're very popular to talk about your nutrition or should you take supplements and should you exercise. One, because those are controllable factors. But I feel like there's a lot of docs out there, and I'm not talking bad about them, but who don't even acknowledge or address this mental health side and this component of infertility. I'm not really sure... Why? I think that we both are really quite aware of it, but I think it's one thing that it's important that physicians or those who are in medicine know that in all fields, but especially in this one, that you know mental health issues are high on the list of issues we have here. And if we're ignoring your own mental health in this process, we're probably not really helping the patients. Absolutely. I think, too, that it's your level of comfort. I think that just doctors and medical providers are human and bringing up something that's a little bit gray and a little bit um, uncomfortable for a lot of people to talk about, you know, emotional wellness, signs of depression, anxiety. Maybe they don't have a lot at their fingertips as far as answers and they're just nervous about talking to patients about it. I think that's a fair point and a lovely segue. Will you kind of go over for people who maybe are not in the medical field and not quite as aware, what are the signs of depression? What are the signs of anxiety? How do we look out for these things? Absolutely. So mood can absolutely be affected. Signs of mood changes with depression can be anxiety, sadness, a loss in activities that used to give you pleasure. So I think that's a really big warning sign. Um, If you have somebody that usually has found joy in going out to parties or doing some sort of creative hobby, and then all of a sudden they have apathy towards these things that used to give them joy, that's a big sign of depression. It can show up in um, physical signs as well too. Sleep can get disrupted, either sleeping too much or sleeping too little. Um, Your appetite can be affected, eating too much or eating too little. So those are physical and mental and mood changes that can come with depression. Anxiety can show up similarly, but also more associated with being a little bit more revved up. Sometimes people feel um, a little bit irritable, restless, um, have difficulty concentrating, have unwanted thoughts, fatigue. Um, I feel like I'm describing... (laughs) You know myself on certain days yeah. too, but it's it, it's sort of like, well, when do you say it's at a level that is serious? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's hard. I think understanding that there's situational circumstances, and then there's things that overwhelm your whole life. You know, you're working a 24 hour shift, and of course, you're going to have loss of appetite. You're going to be very sleepy. You're going to feel burnt out. You're not going to be happy. You're going to be distracted. But fertility is not just an overnight shift, right? Sometimes we have patients that struggle with infertility and with their fertility journey for years. So this is now becoming almost a chronic condition. And I explain it to my patients that living in a level of depression or anxiety, there are hormonal changes that affect the body, that high stress releases cortisol from the adrenal glands, 
And if we go back to when humans first came around, cortisol levels would be high in times of high stress that were acute, like running from a bear. And if the brain is blind and it just hears these hormone signals, it doesn't know if we're running from a bear or if we are just chronically stressed. And if you're running from a bear the entire time, your whole life, for years, you can't handle other things. And so the body's going to start to shut down other processes that seem not as important as running from the bear, like getting pregnant is one of them. And I feel like what we are living in right now is we have a lot of, I mean, people in the world, but certainly patients with infertility who are living in chronically elevated stress level times. And I think that at least one thing we have to do is to tell them it's okay to acknowledge this. It's important to tell your physician about this. And three, there is no shame in the game of seeking help. I think there's so much shame and burden that women especially are really having a hard time admitting some of these feelings. Yeah, I really want patients to hear that they're not alone. I want them to hear these statistics and just how common it is. Um, I love that you bring up the cortisol levels and this heightened level of intensity because I do believe in general that life is just moving so much faster these days and we're always on our screens and we're thinking about running around and living at this really high intense level. And so very often when I bring this up with patients or they bring it up with me, they want to know, does infertility, you know, is infertility caused by stress? If we, if we really go to it, they start to feel a little hopeless. They sort of say, well, I can't stop the stress in my daily life of my job or my family or what I'm doing. And I say, that doesn't mean that you don't address it and really work on ways to manage it. And this, I've got a great example. I think about when somebody walks into the street and almost gets hit by a bus. Everybody's going to be stressed in that situation But people who have worked really hard on stress management skills are going to recover from that incident a lot faster, and they're going to be at this high level of intensity and high cortisol levels for a lot shorter time. So no matter who you are or if you're focused on just getting to the next goal, like getting pregnant or having that baby, that doesn't mean that you get to put off learning how to cope with stress because... It's going to help you in all aspects of life, and it's going to help you recover from pretty stressful situations. So if we talk about stress for a moment, so stress specifically, I talk about this all the time with patients, and it's not often me bringing up, it's them. Does stress impact infertility? And I think we know that it impacts infertility in multiple different ways. I mean, one common example is extreme stress on the body can cause the brain to stop sending out hormones to have a woman ovulate. So that one's an obvious example that if you do not ovulate, you cannot get pregnant. So extreme stress to the brain in a multitude of different fashions, the brain says, nope, we can't handle it, stop sending out FSH and LH, therefore no ovulation. But what about that chronically elevated stress level in the woman who is still ovulating? Does that have other impacts? And I think there's data leading us to the fact that it may have other impacts on fertility, but also it's hard for us to know what you can do about stress. What do you tell patients when they ask you about this? Absolutely. I think um, there are very different ways to help manage stress and pay attention to the emotional wellness of each patient. And so we give patients options and we talk through, I think one-on-one counseling is fantastic. And I really wish that all my patients could do that. I often get a lot of pushback with time and cost Mm -hmm. and yeah, Absolutely. Money. And then they sort of say, well, I've already got so many appointments with you, Dr. Shaheen, that I can't imagine fitting in more appointments. Um, So sometimes people find um, uh, free groups, you know, through resolve.org. There's some infertility support groups that are out there that can help people. Sometimes people find online coaches, like through Skype, so they can do it at off hours. Um, I give a book list to help people learn a little bit about stress management. I think about um, mindfulness coaching and apps. There's a great app for fertility patients specifically called Ferdy Calm. 
you can download it for free. And there's Ferdy Calm for Women and um, Ferdy Strong for Men. And it walks you through mindfulness exercises and specific situations. Like I'm going to a baby shower and it's making me feel this way. And then you'll hear kind of a little coaching on how you could be, you know, bring breathing into that situation. Um, so we really try to find things that can fit each individual person. There's no one size fits all. I, first of all, you guys can't see me obviously, but I'm over here shaking my head as Laura's talking. And then as she's talking about things that I don't know, like a book list is brilliant. I don't know why I've never thought about a book list and, you know, utilizing app resources. So I'm seriously, when we're done, going to go change my next step sheet. So if you're one of my patients, you'll see new things on that. But I think it's so important. I also share very similar, very low threshold to say here, you know, as a psychologist who works with us, we have one with our clinic. She's not physically in our clinic, but she'll do Skype consults. And so that's a good resource for patients, but it still is extra time and extra money. And those barriers are very strong, especially when we are looking at how expensive and how lengthy and how many appointments go into infertility. And I think that's really hard. I've always wondered, should I be screening my patients? So I did this study in fellowship, showed that there's a lot of depression, anxiety out there, even to the levels that would be truly diagnosed as major depression. Yet currently in private practice, I'm not screening my patients on intake for this. And I don't think you are either. Not in a formal way, but I ask every patient an open-ended question you know, how are you dealing with the emotional aspect of, of where you are right now? And what do you do with the information they give you? I listen and I validate their feelings and I talk about resources. So it really can, I think one of the reasons physicians don't bring it up is because they don't know what to say and they're worried that it's going to take a lot of time to talk about the emotional aspect and we already have so much to talk about in our fertility visits, but it doesn't have to take time to just acknowledge how important it is. I agree completely. And one thing that I found in my own studies that we published was that patients will stay in treatment longer. So when I try to talk to physicians or providers about this and young physicians, our fear of wasting time by talking about mental health or stress is actually unfounded because we're wasting our time if the patient never feels comfortable enough to move forward. Even though it may take us five minutes longer in the current moment, if it's a little carrot that then allows the patient to open up or feel more comfortable or seek help or treatment to reduce that, and then they're able to continue on with fertility treatments, that in and of itself is much better utilization of a physician's time, don't you think so? Absolutely. And Ali Domar has done excellent research into this very question. She works in Massachusetts, which is an insurance mandated state. And she has a unique way uh, and perspective. And with her research, she has shown, she assumed going into the research that the reason that patients dropped out of fertility care or stopped before they did an IVF cycle was either they were poor prognosis, so they didn't think it, they'd have a chance of it being successful. Or it might be a financial limitation. And what she found is that that is not the case. The majority of patients did not continue. If they had a good prognosis and if they had coverage, the majority of them did not continue because of um, stress, anxiety, and depression. I think that is so important that everybody hears, and it probably really does relate to fields outside of ours also, that patients leave medical care not often because of the financial burden or the time burden, but because of the emotional burden. And if we are not helping patients be supported in the emotional journeys of their disease, and you and I will both agree that infertility is a disease, that we are not really empowering them in the full the way that we should. And if we're ignoring their mental health, we're not treating the full person. And we really need to be addressing this in some form, whether it is with a true survey or screening, whether it's with a simple question, whether it's by just giving at least resources at the end of the day. But I think in some way, every one of us who takes care of patients needs not to avoid talking about mental health issues, stress, depression, anxiety, just because they're difficult. I think by doing that, we're really doing a disservice to our patients. And what would you say 
would be a take-home message to physicians about screening and then tell me what you know about interventions. Like, is it worth screening? Because what can you do about it? That's great. I'd love physicians just to hear that it doesn't have to take a lot of time to acknowledge the emotional wellness of our patients and that it really can help their overall well-being. Specifically in fertility care, there are studies vary, um, but there are studies showing that paying attention to emotional wellness and having interventions like mindfulness training and stress reduction will improve success rates with treatment. Um, People go back and forth as to why they're seeing this benefit, and part of it is that people are staying in treatment that are able to stay in treatment, and part of it is just seeing a higher success rate when patients are being well cared for. I don't know if this is accurate, so you can tell me, but I always explain to patients that being highly stressed or having untreated mental health like depression or anxiety is like having a constant state of inflammation. Maybe there's not true impact on this one particular thing that we can identify, but it's more of a generalized thing that makes the body less receptive to a pregnancy or a more toxic environment. I don't think it's toxic, like really like there are toxins in you, but that your body is purposefully making it harder because it is struggling to deal with what it's dealing with. And I don't know if that's a true accurate statement, but I sometimes try to relate it in that way because I think as a society, we know inflammation bad. We're always talking about how do we lower inflammation? Inflammation causes pain. It causes other issues. And the same thing, I feel like stress is very similar to that. But I always have patients ask me, is it like chicken and egg? Well, now I'm stressed about my infertility. So my infertility is actually the root of my stress. Or is it, well, I'm stressed and it's causing my infertility. Do you ever have patients bring that up to you? Absolutely. And one thing that I do worry about is telling somebody the link between stress and infertility and then having them stress about being stressed. Yes. Because then we're just creating more worry. And so it's more about managing stress, working on stress reduction techniques, managing emotional wellness so that somebody can stay in treatment, be resilient, um, and continue to try if that's the right choice for them. And I think it's really important, and I tell patients this too, when I get pushback from them about going to see a therapist or getting a coach or joining a support group about the time it's going to take, is that there have been studies shown that it will improve their chances of getting pregnant, like a very tangible phrase that I say to patients. And I don't know if you ever use similar language or what you tell them. Yeah, I do talk about that. And I also talk about how I I bring it out to a broader picture beyond just fertility because some of our patients are so goal-oriented and they really use compartmentalization as a way to cope with, with their stress and worries. So they're focused on just getting to a pregnancy test or just getting to a baby. But I say, you know, take the time to work on these techniques and these tools like mindfulness or low impact exercise or um, reading, you know, certain books that help you because you're going to build tools that you will use for the rest of your life. You can't just be so goal oriented and let's look at it in a big picture. What do you say to patients who ask you, what's the best way to reduce stress? That's a great question. I say it's let's talk about what your life is like and let's bring it back to you because it's so different for each patient. Um, but finding something that is not very expensive in the long term, you know, something like habits that they can make as a part of their everyday life. Um, I think exercise is can be free and you know low impact and something that could be habit forming. Um, Mindfulness is not as intimidating as meditation. Um, Mindfulness is being aware of your surroundings, being grateful for um, certain situations that you're in, Um, finding that right technique for you. I get asked all the time about acupuncture, yoga, and these alternative methods. And I always use the example, but I can't wait to hear what you say, that for stress reduction, acupuncture and sham acupuncture. So sham acupuncture is when you 
don't put the needles in the right spots. Like it's not quite as like point specific as traditional acupuncture is. And they both showed improvement over nothing that I'm not discrediting acupuncture in general, but I think some of that is the act of doing that, of going into a dark room, scheduling time out of your busy schedule, time just to be with yourself and in your own mind, as you said, is meaningful of itself. Do I think some people get extra benefit from acupuncture? I do. But I also think some people hate needles and that's not the right thing for them. So I do think that it is about how can you carve out time for you? And some people really do have to put it on their schedule. Like I have an appointment, so I know I can dedicate this 30-minute session to me. And really anything that can drop those cortisol levels down, get you more in touch with your feelings because accepting them is a big part of the process, not being in denial. Yeah. It's honestly like hearing myself talk sometimes <laughs> when you're saying things. I say the exact same thing. I say, I, if someone asks about acupuncture, I say, well, have you tried it before? Or what do you think about it? And if they look at me with big wide eyes and they say, I hate needles or I've tried it before and I hated it. And I said, well, then that's probably the not, not the right fit for you. So let's talk about something else. I do think, and I, if I were to create a fertility clinic and I had all the money in the world and patients paid for nothing, I would certainly have a mental health professional who every patient met with at every visit. They would see you, then they would go see them and be able to talk through things because being somebody who's gone to therapy myself before, there's really nothing else that allows you to both admit and process your own feelings quite like there is with going to therapy. And I think that that is a very empowering thing for patients. It feels very non-empowering, like that you're weak, that you need help, or there's something wrong with you because you're depressed. But the truth is the place where you're the most vulnerable is when you're depressed and not being treated. Seeking help or getting treated is where you really start to develop strength from this. And you can come from that vulnerable place and then become stronger. And so I'm like, go to therapy, go to therapy. And I want to add to that, that taking care of yourself, going to therapy, going to acupuncture, exercising is not a selfish thing. I often have patients give pushback when I talk about ways to practice self-care and take care of themselves, and they worry that it's going to take time away from their work, time away from their partner, time away from their current family situation. And I just try to really emphasize that if you practice self-care and you're in a good mental health spot in your life, you're going to be a better partner, worker, um, you know, family member. And I just really try to turn that conversation around. I agree completely. I love the, you know, self-care is not selfish type of situation. And I also think it's worth noting that we're talking about a lot of mindfulness or alternative therapies that traditional medications are not always a bad thing. I do see patients even fearful to admit that they're taking an antidepressant. And here's my take on it. There's a lot of antidepressants we don't know stuff about. There's some that are bad and some that look better. So I always want to know, of course, you do do every medication, herb, supplement, every single thing that you're taking. But when it comes to antidepressants or anxiety medications, if it's a known harmful one, we need to get off of it. If it's one that's in between, but you've been controlled and you feel good in this place, the last thing I really want to do is pull that away from you during a highly stressful time. I'm going to look at you and say, Infertility is known to be stressful, so I don't know that this is the time to come off of your medication. Certainly, if it's an as-needed anxiety medication, we don't want to be addicted, so I'm always trying to wean that down and look at other options for how we can utilize that less. But your daily antidepressants, for many women, I say, hey, let's get you through and get you pregnant and you know work with your psychiatrist and see if there's a good time to come off the medication in early pregnancy once the stress of infertility has bypassed us. I don't know if you have a different approach or how you feel about that. Oh, I agree exactly with what you said. And I, um, I don't prescribe um, medications for mental health, but and I always want patients to be working with someone that it's a team effort because I'm often seeing people for a very finite amount of time. It's until they conceive and then maybe through the first trimester, but I want someone to care for them long term as well. I'm really lucky because in Austin, we have an amazing psychiatrist. Her name is Kristen Lassiter. So Kristen, I love you. She's on Instagram at the.reproductive.psychiatrist. 
And she's a psychiatrist who loves women and reproductive health. So she does infertility, counseling during pregnancy and postpartum. And she prescribes medications. She manages them. She goes to see patients in the hospital if they're having like an acute psychotic break or need something immediately post-delivery. It's really an incredible resource for patients. And I love that she's there in town. So certainly follow her. She's the expert in this. But I do want to say that we need to take women's mental health very seriously. That just because you have an issue, it may not be related only to infertility. We don't want our mothers to then be struggling with postpartum depression, suicide, infant side, you know, things that are seriously happening. But there is a statistic you have about women who are in this infertile population who are struggling that's really pretty sobering, at least to me, right? Absolutely. In doing research for this podcast, I found a study in 2016 um, from a psychiatry journal that said that 9% of our patients who are struggling with infertility have had suicidal thoughts. I think that's so alarming, one. And two, if that doesn't make you feel like there's something we need to take seriously in this conversation, then you're not paying attention. You're missing the obvious factor. So if you're a physician in any field, I'm going to tell you if that's our patient population, probably yours too. And if you're young and going to become a physician, please give serious thoughts to how mental health can impact your own field and how you can really best empower patients. And if you're a patient... I want to say that you're not alone, that the majority of people in your shoes are struggling like you are if this is you. And if you are feeling desperate, hopeless, alone, isolated, sad, moody, irritable, you're noticing physical changes, you're unable to deal with your surroundings, it is okay to tell somebody. And you really deserve that. You know, you don't deserve to be feeling like that and let it get to such a bad place. How do you want to leave with patients feeling? That's just beautiful. I really appreciate your taking the time to do this podcast and address such an important issue. And I would really love for patients to hear us talking about this, feel less alone, feel less broken, and seek the help that they need because it's out there. Okay, let's give a shout out, Laura. I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Will you tell everybody where they can find you on social media, your website, your books, and all of the things? Thank you. Um, I am Dr. Laura Shaheen and on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, I do have my own website, drlaurashaheen.com, where you can find blog posts and links to a lot of interviews that I've done and wonderful podcasts in this, just like this one. Okay, and she does have a great book called Not Broken. It does touch on some of the emotional aspects too. It's more specifically related into talking about pregnancy loss and miscarriage, but really is a lovely, wonderful resource. And I just want to thank you guys so much for listening. Please share this episode. I appreciate every rating review. Anytime you talk about it, it really does mean so much to me. And I'm hoping that if you are struggling, if you're concerned a friend is struggling, that you share this so that we can help everybody know that they really are not alone and that we are stronger together and that there's no shame in admitting some of these feelings. The true disservice is not addressing them and letting something get past a point where you can't do anything about it. Friends, thank you so much for listening today. As always, I appreciate your support of the As A Woman podcast so much. This medium of being able to communicate and connect with you is so super powerful and your support keeps encouraging me to keep going. I also love every suggestion you send in, whether it's on Instagram or email or the website for suggestions on episodes. I have a running list, guys. We're going to keep this podcast going for a long time. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out. I love every rating, review, and share. It means so much. And just thank you so, so much. You can follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, the blog, nataliecrawfordmd.com, or also asawoman.com.